there! Welcome to the new schools! If you haven't been following our next guest, well, you should. In this whole movement of promoting childhood independence and play, she's one of the most prolific and entertaining voices out there. She's helping adults let go and let grow. It's Lenore Skenazy! A few years ago, Lenore wrote an article for the New York Sun called Why I Let My Nine-Year-Old Ride the Subway Alone. That was a true story, and it went super viral. She was on every talk show and even had her own reality show, embracing her new nickname, World's Worst Mom. She responded by continuing to write. There's a book and a very active blog titled Free Range Kids. This is where you can learn a lot about things like crime statistics, just how much safer kids are today than they were in the past, or about local laws regarding children's independence. There have been too many tragic stories where parents face criminal charges for letting kids play on their own. Now, thanks in part to Lenore and her team, states are finally amending their laws to make it explicit that your child walking to the playground alone, for example, doesn't warrant police intervention or constitute an act of neglect. As the Free Range Kids movement grew, Lenore brought together other superstars in the field who combined their powers to form Let Grow, a nonprofit promoting childhood independence. These superstars, Daniel Shookman, chairman of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, New York University's Jonathan Haidt, co-author of The Coddling of the American Mind, and Boston College psychology professor Peter Gray, author of Free to Learn. If you don't know any of these folks, look them up. They're doing incredible work. LetGrow.org is all about making it easy, normal, and legal to give kids some independence, letting them learn through play and discovering their own interests. But unlike our typical guests, they didn't start by building a new school based on this mission. Instead, they found a way to do it within the existing traditional school system. They encourage and support teachers in giving their students the following assignment. With your parents' approval, go do something new on your own that you feel ready to do. That's it. You won't believe what a profound impact this challenge has on kids and families and you can check out some of those stories at letgrow.org. Click the logo on the video to subscribe, and we'll keep bringing you more conversations like this with your host, Shannon Falkenstein and Lenore Skenazy. Wow, wow. Okay, so I have to ask about Mad Magazine. <laughs> yes, so love thank Mad God. Magazine. Somebody cares. First of all, it means you're at least over the age of like 15 because I don't think kids today kids today kids, uh, today. <laughs> kids today I sound just like the people that mad was always making fun of we eventually <laughs> become the thing we hate the most um so yeah mad I tried to write for mad a lot and I ended up writing for mad a little um but then there was always cracked do you remember cracked I do Okay, so Cracked would take a lot of the stuff that Mad wouldn't. And I think it's so ironic because now Mad is dead and Cracked is really funny. It's all over the web. They have this great website. Um, but we never knew it then. So that's Nice. It. How cool. So you like freelance wrote. And yeah, 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 yeah. Lots of, lots of silly stuff. My husband thinks that I have a 12-year-old boy's sense of humor, which has <laughs> served me well. Um, so that was it. And I keep them in an ever more yellowing stack of, you know, like those were the days I just wrote. Can you believe I wrote for Mad? So Mad would never let you um, use the same name if you wrote for Cracked. So it's a drag because I had my real name is in Cracked because I wrote for them first. 
And then, uh, you know, a pseudonym in MAD, which is... Uh, what was it? I should have said my pseudonym was like whatever the guy's name is who wrote Spy versus Smy. Was that you? Yes, that's my pseudonym. No, my pseudonym is Lori Coleman. Lori is an old nickname. Coleman's my husband's last name. So go digging through the MAD archives for those three articles that <laughs> got published in MAD, including a... Um, restaurant reviews from a fly's point of view. Oh, nice. Yes, yes. <laughs> Delicious splattered food everywhere. I love this place. Yeah. How oh, fun. Oh, yeah. that's so cool. That's really cool. Um, so, okay. And then you had a show called the World's Worst Mom based yeah. on letting your nine-year-old son ride the subway. Yeah. So let my nine-year-old ride the subway alone, wrote a column about it. I'm a newspaper columnist. What's a newspaper, mom? And, um... And two days after the column was on, uh, it was in the paper, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR. And uh, it's 13 years later. He's 23. I guess it's 14 years later now. I just, um, anyway, so uh, a couple of years after the column, someone from Discover Television, Discovery Channel, um, you know, found me and said, let's do a TV show. And I said, sure. And these things never happen, but it happened. Uh, so, you know, suddenly somebody's like tailoring clothes for you and getting funny little hair swatches that match your hair. So suddenly your hair looks like it's not scraggly and awful, um, which is why I'm so worried about a, uh, whether this is going to be video or audio. Um, and then they found me the 13 most anxious families in America and Canada and had me sort of, uh, you know, plunge into them and, do a, I guess it's called an intervention where I would sit down with the parents and they would tell me what they were scared of. And it's like, we don't want our son to walk to school. We don't want him to be home alone. We don't, you know, a mom who put cameras in her house to make sure the kids never left a mom who got her son a, a skateboard, but only let him play with it. If he stood stock still on it on the grass, <laughs> you know, like the wheels weren't allowed to move. And a mom who was feeding his, her 10 year old in his mouth, um, you know, like, like a baby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> let him, wouldn't let him pour milk. Cause it could, you know, pour, don't pour juice. Cause it could spill. Don't drink milk. Cause you could get phlegm. Can't walk to school. You could get abducted. Don't ride a bike. You could fall off. No overnights. You could be molested, blah, 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 blah. But she was married to a guy, uh, second marriage for both who had a, a six-year-old girl who was doing all that stuff because he trusted her to do things. And so there was all this tension, you know, the 10 year old was a guy and embarrassed and, you know, twice as large as the six year old. And she'd be going, I'm going riding my bike, you know? So I don't have a background in psychology. Mm -hmm. Nope. Yeah. Anthropology. Anthropology. Okay. That might explain a little bit about the El Salvador. Cool. What'd you study in anthropology? I studied biological anthropology. So it was a science, it was like a pretty heavy science with, um, with anthropology, but it looked a lot at like mating systems, population genetics, like the sex differences in the brain. Ooh. Yeah. Like kind of like explaining why humans are the way that we are. And I loved it. Loved That's it, loved cool. It. Do you do that now? Do you do some of that? No, I just Not think officially. it like informs <laughs> a lot of what I do, but uh -huh. yeah. Wow, that's cool. I and I became a science teacher in New York later. Oh, you're kidding. At, so, at a middle school or what? Yeah, middle school science on the wow. Upper East Side and then the Upper West Side. And then I moved here. Wow. Um, what school on the Upper East Side? My kids went to a middle school on the Upper East Side. Wagner. Oh, okay. That was just a couple blocks. My kids went to East Side Middle. Oh, my super good friend is a math teacher there, Alicia Pilgrim. Oh, I know the name. Yeah. She's a science teacher. No, science teacher, not math, not math. Okay. Science teacher. I don't anyway. know where I knew the name from. I didn't know a lot of their teachers, but that's cool. Wow. Small world alert. Yeah. <laughs> I Actually, shouldn't taught there. You did, her. under David yeah. Getz? Yes, under the fabulous David messianic Getz. David Getz? Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I remember when we, you know, you go looking for middle schools when you're, you know, in sixth and fifth grade. And I loved Eastside Middle, that's where my son wanted to go. And um, my friend who'd gone on the tour with me said, oh, the one with the messianic guy? <laughs> I'm like, yes. <laughs> you totally. know, he does look sort of like a Giacometti, you know, Christ type figure. He's really he skinny with the beard. But um, so if you see the movie Chasing Childhood, and I highly recommend the movie, and I highly recommend interviewing the people who made it, um, 
you'll see these sixth graders who do the Let Grow project. Uh -huh. Guess what middle school they're at? At Eastside. They're at Eastside Middle. Wow. Yeah, because that was an easy place for them to get a, you know, to, That's to grease the wheels to go and film because it's hard to film in a school. I was just talking to, I want to do a virtual screening of a race to nowhere. So I was oh, talking yes. to them and then they're like, you got to do taste and childhood. It's the most recent one. And I was like, okay, great. So I'm, I'm actually like emailing with them right now. So, you know what I finally met because she's doing the distribution of chasing childhood, Vicky. I don't know how you pronounce her last name, a Bellis or a, a whatever name is Vicky, the lady who did the race to nowhere. And it was like talking to you. It was like another cousin of mine. She was just so great and so concerned. And she's, she's really interested in teaching math. Ah. I mean, that's her thing is not just, you know, what's happening to childhood and too much pressure and crazy emphasis on grades and college and all that. But also it's like, how come math is taught to, to make everybody hate it? And right. she doesn't, yeah. Yeah, totally. That's yeah, great. so you'll talk to her. So there I was with the mother, and I'm not a psychologist, and neither are you apparently, although you know more about the brain probably than I do. And um, and my job was to give the families these four different, each family would get four challenges where I would basically sit on the parents <laughs> while I sent the kids out to, you know, go get a gallon of milk or go climb a tree or go, you know, visit your cousin down the block or whatever it was. And the parents really did freak out. And I sort of freaked out because I'm not used to being like, first of all, I'm not a hard ass. You know, I'm like, you must sit here. And then secondly, I'm like, <laughs> I don't know if this is going to work. And um, it was my first you know, my first realization that the stuff I think is true is true, which is that if you can somehow convince parents just once or just twice to to not accompany their children on any kind of adventure, to not make it better, safer, more educational, more structured, more perfect, if you can just get them to sit at home and drink coffee with me, while the kids go out and do something, when the kids come home, it's amazing. So I'll tell you, so the first family was the family with the 10-year-old the boy who was being fed in his mouth and couldn't go on an overnight, couldn't walk to school and couldn't ride a bike. And the reason the mom didn't want him to learn how to ride a bike was because, A, he would probably fall and she was worried about that, you know, hurting himself. But she also didn't want him to be frustrated because it's, you know, I don't know how you can ride, learn to ride a bike without being frustrated. You know, it's frustrating because it, at first you can't do it or it's scary or whatever. Um, and so, you know, these, it, it looks like these are all my ideas. It was actually all the producer's ideas. And they said, okay, we got him a bike. I'm like, oh, don't make him learn how to ride a bike on yeah. national television. <laughs> you know, he's 10, it's horrible. I'm like, <clears throat> Lenore, you give him the bike and you say, today we're going to learn how to ride a bike. I'm like, Sammy, today we're going to learn how to ride a bike. And the mother is getting hysterical and I'm getting hysterical because I don't want to be in front of this poor kid, you know, falling and my fault. But um, sure enough, uh, I got him a bike. And this was one usually we weren't with the kid when they were doing something. But in this case, we were there and we take him and the bike and his family and the camera crew to a big empty parking lot. And OK, here you go. And it was painful to watch, you know, because he would go like he forgot, he would always forget to use one foot. So like he'd go a, like a half a revolution of the bike thing. And then it would be like, you got to keep going. Right, like <laughs> no <know>? momentum. <laughs> no momentum. And it was always in a curve, you know, it would always be like down. So, um, but finally he started to get the hang of it. And we were there for like filming for like an hour. And by the end of the hour, he could go from one side of the parking lot to the other, which is I don't know, like 50 feet or whatever. And he was pretty stoked, you know? And we came home and this is what also made me realize like a couple of things. One is that the camera crew will never be where you want the camera crew to be. It's because I, I went into the house first and the camera crew is busy unloading everything. And the mother comes in and the grandmother, Sammy's grandmother is in the house already. And so the mother, Paulina bursts in and she goes, guess what, mom, Sammy can ride a bike. And the grandmother goes, our Sammy, she's Russian, our Sammy, you ride bike? Yes, mom, he's riding a bike. He learned to ride a bike. And they were overjoyed. They were like, this is great. Sammy can ride a bike. Sammy can ride a bike. And I'm looking at them like, who said Sammy couldn't ride a bike? Who said Sammy couldn't ride a bike? And obviously, them. And and it was my first recognition of the, of the I guess, the, the very thinness of our terror 
you know, it seems solid and leaden and you can't possibly punch through and overprotective parents are going to be hovering over, you know, the children as they get married and forever. And in fact, simply showing a parent how competent their kid can be, it breaks it. It's like you come out of a coma. And, and the coma thing kept happening because at the beginning of every show, I would, I would interview the parents and then I'd, they'd be in some other room and then I would just talk to the kids. Kids, what aren't you allowed to do? Oh, we're not allowed to go on an overnight. We're not allowed to uh, you know, use a sharp knife. We're not allowed to plug in the vacuum cleaner. One family wouldn't allow anybody to plug in the vacuum cleaner because they would get a, you know, electrocuted, couldn't bring the laundry down the stairs because they would trip and fall and hit their heads and die. You know, really <laughs> wacky stuff. And at the end of being with the families for just four days and sending the kids out on these little errands, um, that I think probably you did as a kid without anybody giving a second thought to, you know, go ride your bike around the block, that kind of thing. Um, I would show the parents the list and they'd be reading it. And one time, one of the moms just sank down. She was so ashamed. Like I said this. And then the mom who wouldn't let the kids plug in any, anything or, or help at all, because whatever they did, they would hurt themselves. She was like, like, couldn't come up with words because she couldn't remember ever saying these things. Like, why wouldn't I let them plug in a vacuum cleaner? I wouldn't let them make dinner. She, it was like, that's why I say it's like waking up from a coma. So what seems to be, you know, like, like you're out, you, this will never change. You know, you flatlined is really, really easy to change. The second you see your kids doing something on their own. That's, that's like my giant psychological insight that I wish everybody shared because it, it holds the possibility of changing everybody really fast, making everybody much more lighthearted, much more calm, much more confident, kids more mature and grateful and parents more free time. And all it requires is letting go. And the thing that about it is that by me coming to these people's homes, they had me pushing them to let go and they had the excuse if anything went wrong, if their kids did hurt themselves, it was crazy Lenore's fault, not theirs. So you need to absolve people of guilt and you uh -huh. need to push them to let go. And that one-two punch breaks the spell of terrified overprotection. Wow, that's a great story. And how does that, how do, do you, are you still using that one-two punch and kind of the other things that you do? Yeah. So a few years ago, Free Range Kids. So I started Free Range Kids after I was on the, all the TV shows and stuff. So wait, Lenore, like prior oh, yes, to, no, no, no. Like, I, like, I just want to make sure I, ca I recap this for the, for the audience. So prior to sending your son on the subway alone from Bloomingdale's when he was nine, like you were not into this kid thing. No, um, you were no. right. You were a writer. I was a, I was a newspaper reporter and then I was a columnist and I liked writing funny stuff mm -hmm. and I was a features writer. I wrote food stuff before that. Yeah. I okay. Mean, and then you did the subway, you wrote about it and then you had the show and then you became like Lenore, who's all about free range kids. Right. So what happened is I did the, um, you know, I wrote why I let my nine year old ride the subway alone. Then I was on those, you know, all these talk shows and that weekend I started the blog free range kids uh, and I trademarked that name um, because uh, you don't get to have your say <laughs> when you're on the talk shows, you know, it's generally um, you're being shamed, right? Don't you care about if he's safe or not? How would you feel if he died? I mean, it's all framed as uh -huh. what a crazy person you are and why weren't you thinking the pessimistic way that is sort of um, it's, it's like a hairstyle. I mean, it's like if you wore your hair the way people looked in the 1920s, you would look strange now. If you mm -hmm. had confidence in your kids now, that's strange. Yeah. So I, I was like out of step with society by saying, I think the kids can do some stuff on their own. And by not thinking about the worst case scenario, I mean, they, they kept asking on all these talk shows, it would be like, oh, what'd you do? You let him go. How was it? He had fun. He was proud. And then the question would always be, but how would you have felt if he hadn't come home? And, and it's like, uh, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> boy, what a waste of nine years. You know, I could have eaten all that food myself. I could have gone and lived in El Salvador, but I had to raise that kid and now he's dead. I mean, it was just such a, a weird right. um, and distressing and depressing question that it took me, you know, I sort of, tried to figure out why they always asked it. 
And it took a long time to figure out that the reason they asked it when they knew exactly how I'd feel, you know, tormented, guilty, horrible, depressed, maybe never better, I don't know, um, was because, well, two things. One is it was the, the, you're supposed to think that way when you let your kid, when you consider letting your kid do anything, which is why you're not supposed to let your kids do anything. A good parent doesn't let their kids do anything without them supervising them all the time because they should be thinking about all the horrible things that could happen. So that's sort of a weird trope that we all do now, like a knee jerk thing. It's like, well, if I let him drink from the hose, what if he gets cancer from the PCBs and the plastic? And if I let her play on the playground, what if she gets kicked by somebody on the, on the swing set? And if I let him walk to school, what if he gets, you know, kidnapped? It's, you're always going, it's almost like a parlor game. What's the worst, the very worst thing that could happen. You know, if I let him take the laundry down the stairs, he could trip and break his neck. It's just become a sort of like a, a normal thing people do. And, and if you're not doing it, you're doing it wrong. So that's, that's like a big um, thing we have to change in society, that the only good way to think about your children is to think about how bad you'd feel if they died because you did X. Do you, do you feel like that's changing? I, maybe it's just because I'm in the Acton New Schools culture that mm-hmm. we are 100% pro letting kids do it all um you know they're using power tools at like nine years old in our school but do you so do you feel like that's changing or do I just have that perception because I'm in a subculture you're definitely in a subculture um I'm I'm always like vibrating between these two uh, you know magnetic polar opposites on the one Mm. hand I think yeah I mean I think free range kids became a movement you know I think people think about What is the downside of overprotection? But then, you know, I get Parents Magazine every month and (laughs) there'll be something new about how, you know, remember every second you spend with your baby is really important. So constantly stimulate them and, and, um, you know, talk to them and sing to them and start reading to them, even though they're, you know, they've only been out for 12 hours and they're still all covered with that cookie stuff. (laughs) So, um, it's, you know, that doesn't sound like it's about safety, but then from there, it's, it's always like, what can you be doing to help protect, enrich and enhance their lives? And it always involves you. Right. So I don't think the message is one or the other. Uh, and I think parents are being driven crazy. And as somebody said, it's like, it's not like there's no parenting books. It's that there's parenting books across this entire spectrum and how are you supposed to know what to do? And you know, that's why I don't think of myself as a parenting expert. I just sort of look at the culture and go, what is weird about the way we're thinking? What Mm -hmm. is new about, you know, this ultra pessimism that's considered sophistication? Why? But I did it too. I mean, I I was in the same bubble. I walked my kids to school all the time. My mom didn't walk me to school. And and it never even occurred to me, like, why am I standing with the kids at school every morning? You know, it's because everybody else is standing with their kids at, at the school gate every morning. There's just a zillion people there. Yeah. You know, I listened to a podcast a few years ago that I wish I could remember what episode, um, maybe it was hidden brain. Maybe it was, it was a man. It must've been hidden brain, but it was like, they said prior, do you remember the shooting in you in UT Austin, uh, from the tower the guy? Hour? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is that Stuart Brown studied. Yeah. Yeah. That they yeah. said the right, like that, like prior to that, we did not think what is the worst that can happen. But that was the first time that violence like that was televised. Oh, that's interesting. What year was that? Do you have any idea? I want to say the late 70s. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And that since then, because we we all saw it on TV, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it became like, in the public mind, it was like as if it had happened to all of us. So right. then we started to believe like these acts, these like violent acts are, are around the corner and we had to right. start worrying. So instead of realizing like statistically speaking, you're safer <laughs> today than you were in the seventies, we believe that like at any minute, something horrible is going to happen. And I would never forgive myself is like the right. words going through every parent's mind, you know, but 
truly that isn't happening all the time. So anyway, it, it that was happening. like, it was, yeah. it was like, that was like the marker in the culture after which we mm-hmm. all became totally overprotective. And now hopefully I believe, I hope so that it's going to, sw- the pendulum's going to swing back a little bit, you know, hopefully to more being more normal because otherwise these kids are like, n- that now they're going, like I talked to um, Esther Wojcicki the other day mm-hmm. and she said, now there's like a class at Berkeley called adulting because no oh, one sure. knows how to use the laundry mat. You know, the, the, the yeah, machine. machine. Right, right, right. right. You know? So, um, so hopefully this is going to swing back because otherwise poor kids, like that freedom of childhood was the greatest feeling ever. And if you don't have it now, I feel like then you're really, really, you're, you're really neglected because you're not getting to like have this joy that doesn't really come back ever. Yeah, it's, it's the joy. And it's, I think there's a lot of like, enriching vitamins in in the independence, because sometimes when I talk to people, I ask, well, I ask a couple things, I can ask you two both questions, one's harder. Um, One, the easy one is, uh, what did you love doing as a kid, uh, that you don't see kids doing today? And, and, and actually, when I'm, when I'm talking to regular school audiences, I say that you don't let your own kids do. <laughs> but my guess is that you sort of do. So just that you don't see kids doing these days. Yeah. Building forts. Yeah. We loved riding our bikes, like just free all around our neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I even, I remember being nine years old in a bathing suit, riding on the back of a stranger's motorcycle down a busy road. Now, obviously that was not good. Whoa, where was it? I, in St. Louis, in St. Missouri. Louis. Why yeah. St. Louis? My okay. parents were divorced. My mom worked and we just like hung out all summer. We got into tons of trouble and we, nobody died. Nobody even went to the hospital. It was amazing. Um, yeah, that was obviously dangerous, but, um, it was thrilling and, who I remember. You, wait, who picks up a nine-year-old in her <laughs> bathing suit on a motorcycle? This is kind of interesting. We were hanging out at the neighborhood pool in our mm-hmm. apartment complex, <laughs> and um, and like they, you know, they were like young adults who lived in that neighborhood in that apartment complex. And so there was like a guy with a motorcycle and we were like, can we ride on it? You know, this is the seventies. And he's like, wow, sure, whatever. Come on. So it was just like a really short ride. But I remember being out there on Manchester road and being like, like, what am I doing? I didn't even have shoes on Lenore. Wow. So that was thrilling. Um, we used to like swing on this, this like cable did it have electricity? I don't know. <laughs> Over a ravine. Um, and so we did the craziest stuff. Over we, a ravine? Over a ravine. We would, we would, my brother would build these ramps and we would like go on them on our bike and then we would try to lift up as far as we could and then land. Well, of course, sometimes we ate it, right? And we would just get like those, you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Like, like road like, rash. Like 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 yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Wow. One time I lit up a bunch of fireworks and I oh didn't throw them on time and they blew up in my hand. That's- I read a children's book like that when I was a kid. <laughs> Follow my leader. It was all about the the seeing eye dog he needed after that. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's bad. That's bad. But like my hands are fine. You know, I was fine. Like luckily nothing permanent ever happened. Okay. So actually you, you are a perfect person to ask the second question, which is usually hard for most people, which is, okay, so what went wrong one time when you were on your own? And it sounds like a lot of things did. Did you tell your parents? Heck no, I didn't tell my parents <laughs> because I would have been in so much trouble. Not that even that we like, yeah, no, my mom, you know, cause they would have been scared. And then yes. instead of being like, I'm scared, they get angry, right? I mean, we all do the same thing. Don't yeah. just think about coffee in that street, you know? Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, no, I did not tell my parents. You didn't have that kind of relationship with your parents. Yeah. I expect my kids to tell me everything, but maybe I shouldn't. Yeah. You know? Maybe I <laughs> don't. <should>. Okay. <laughs> yeah, your intervention for the day. Yeah, Thank don't. You. <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, yeah, my last year this time, Uh, my son, the subway rider had COVID and apparently he and his brother had talked behind my back and he, and the older brother had said, don't tell mom unless you're in the hospital. So it's not like I'm so brave. It's like, I don't want to know if things are dangerous or scary, you know, just like I like ignorance is my bliss. Don't let me know if something scary is happening, but it's um, I I have, when I have asked people, did something go wrong? And did you tell your parents? The answer is generally exactly yours, which is no. 
And the reason behind that, you know, I guess there's the anger thing, but a lot of times people say, because then they wouldn't let me do anything, right? I couldn't go out on my own, or I couldn't, you know, ride my bike there, or I'd be grounded or something. So yeah, the anger then would beget the punishment, right? Which would be like, you're never leaving the house again. Right. And I don't want so, that but to happen. The pun- it's interesting because punishment was restricting your freedom. And you to preserve your freedom, you persevered, you discovered your own resilience, you held it in, you hid the scars in every which way. And and I think that's what is missing from childhood that is hurting kids. Um, because, you know, we worry that kids seem to be, you know, sensitive and there's a lot of de- anxiety and depression. And how do you, how do you know what you can handle? I mean, like, what is anxiety? Anxiety is worrying that, A, something will happen to you that is, d- you know, dangerous and horrible and bad. And that, B, you won't be able to handle it, right? Not only something bad will happen, but you are not up to ever, you um, you know, becoming whole again. And so you avoid a lot of things. And that's what anxiety is. It's too scary to make that call, too scary to talk to that kid, too scary to do anything. I mean, anxiety is that you, you'll fail and you won't recover. And here you were failing and forced to recover because otherwise your mother would know that you were limping or bloody or broke your bike. And so that's the antidote for anxiety is exposure therapy. I mean, that literally is the, uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, you, you studied this, um, is that you, you deal with, you, you confront what is scaring you. And in doing that, it's not as scary anymore. It loses its power. Just like all these moms, when I did the, the world's worst mom show was, you know, I'm scared to let him ride a bike. And then he rides his bike and he falls down and he gets back up and suddenly he can do it and you can handle it. And so to constantly take these things out of our kids' lives saying, I'll walk you there, I'll drive you there, mm-hmm. I'll watch the practice, I'll throw you the extra balls. It's, um, it's undermining a very normal process of child development, which is being upset, scared, frustrated, and in pain, um, not horrible, any of those things, but those things are, are part of the, the weaving of the brain. And yeah. so I work with Peter Gray, Dr. Yes. Peter Gray, who we all love. He's yes, my favorite. Yes. Um, G-R-A-Y for anybody who wants to look up free to learn. And he says that um, something, you know, I mean, you, you study this way more than me, which is that um, a lot of animals come out like a gazelle apparently is born and an hour later, you know, they're doing everything that they're going to do for the rest of their lives. They're eating, they're running around, they're avoiding lions or whatever. Um, and we come out and we're like flopping around and just completely, you know, helpless for a long time. Our childhood is long. And the reason is that um we're going to have to learn so many different things. You know, if you're living in the North Pole, you're going to learn something different from if you're living in Hawaii versus if you're living in Silicon Valley. And so your brain comes, the, the, the thing it does come equipped with is curiosity and the ability to assimilate experiences. And these will form the foundation for who you are and what you can handle. And if we take so many of those Jenga blocks out because you're not walking to school and you're not climbing the tree and you're not going on the ramp and you're not falling in the ravine, probably the last one is okay to miss. Um, (laughs) You're not getting the wiring. You know, the brain comes expecting the wiring, just like it expects to hear a language. It expects to be betrayed. It expects to be afraid. It expects to fall. And if all that's taken out, you're sending kids out into the world sort of like half brained. Yeah, And I would be anxious too if I had never dealt with anything that was scary or difficult (laughs) or painful. Yeah, it's like you need all those experiences to like push you out of your comfort zone and then you meet yourself out there like, oh, okay, I just built myself up a little bit more. And then it's like you you may, you may build yourself by, I mean, in acting, it's the, the, we talk about the hero's journey constantly. Like mm-hmm. you go out of your comfort zone, you encounter something difficult, you survive, you know, sometimes you fail, but over time you, 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 you get there and it's not about the destination. It's about who you actually become on the road. And, and then that's what builds you into being like always a more capable and ready person. And like, I love that you're talking about the anxiety. I never have really thought about it like that, but you're absolutely right. If you, if you realize like 
I can handle it because if I handled a million things prior to this, then you're, you're, why would you be anxious? But if you really doubt your own capability because it's never been tested, well, there you go. Of course you're anxious, right? Right, which is why that TV show of like the mom who wouldn't let her kid ride on the skateboard and then we take him to a skateboard park and like he can do it and she can handle it. And I was just, I'm thinking about that more these days because you couldn't see the show for like eight years and suddenly it's on YouTube Oh, and cool. the director of photography recently called because he, of course, is doing a podcast who isn't. And <laughs> we were talking about all these families. And, and I said, do you remember that at the end, I brought a sheaf of paper for everybody who was there because I had printed out the letters that the moms, the emails that the moms had written me after the crews had gone home. So, it, you know, I said, I don't, you know, I don't watch a lot of reality TV. And I sort of assume that a lot of it is scripted or fake or whatever. But these were moms writing to me like, you won't believe it. Now, you know, I let him go to overnight bike camp. That was the first mom. Or I let the kid, you know, go to the bathroom by himself at the rest stop or whatever. And it was just, it was all these parents saying, just being so grateful. And, and so, so let grow. So, Let's just go back really quickly and just go over the scaffolding. So let the kid ride the subway, start the blog, free range kids, write the book, free range kids, do the TV show, or get the name world's uh, America's worst mom became my nickname. And you can love it. Look it up. Yeah, I kind of do too. At this point. <laughs> and that's why they call it world's worst mom. I'm the world's worst mom, not the moms I was visiting. And then um, about four years ago, uh, Daniel Shuckman, who used to be the chairman of fire, which fights for free speech on campus was talking to Jonathan Haidt, mm. who everyone thinks is Jonathan Haidt, um, who wrote, co-wrote the, uh, the Coddling of the American Mind. And they were thinking, what's going on on campus? Kids seem fragile. You know, they're, they're availing themselves. I, I think it's good to avail yourself of mental health programs and services, but the numbers were just extraordinary. And there was, you know, sort of... Um, conclusive evidence of rising rates of anxiety, depression, self-harm, stuff I hate to talk about, and and sort of hypersensitivity. And they're like, you know, this can't be happening the instant they're 18 and walk on, you know, across the campus. Yeah. It must be starting younger. Is there anybody fighting this culture that seems to be undermining kids, like the overprotection that's sort of undermining them? And obviously they found me. And then, um, and I said, they said, let's start a nonprofit. And I said, okay, let's bring in Peter Gray as well. So he was one of the co-founders. So the four of us started Let Grow. And the difference between Let Grow and Free Range Kids, aside from the fact that now there's an actual nonprofit and people besides me working there, is that Free Range Kids tried to open everybody's mind to the fact that like, hey, overprotection is not an unalloyed good. It's not like it keeps getting better, 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 the more we protect, the more bumpers we put on everything. Um, not that I like danger, I don't. And I didn't do anything in my childhood like you. I never had a firecracker. <laughs> I don't think I ever went up a ramp, even walking up a ramp. <laughs> um, you know, if it's so, it was like a handicap accessible ramp at the mall or something. <laughs> and all I did was like read and ride my bike. So I didn't have, you know, these, uh, this wild adventuresome childhood. And, um, and yet I had free time. And I got to walk to school and I got to waste my time all day after school, just, you know, drawing or riding my bike or going to the park. And even that is just not allowed anymore. And so um, anyways, so uh, I get the name, I start the blog, I start the movement. I'm pro less overprotection, but I'm not a an evil Knievel mom of any sort. Um, but even all the lectures I gave and my book and everything didn't seem to move the needle. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. it got people talking about the problem. I'd give this lecture all over the country and people would laugh and go, oh my God, that's me. And oh yes, I love my childhood. And oh boy, it's too bad. And they'd leave and they would go back to like driving the kids to soccer the next day. And, and it is hard to change a whole culture. So when we, when we made Let Grow, we decided that rather than changing minds, we wanted to change behavior. Because what I'd seen from that television show is forcing the parents to stay home while the kid goes out, giving the kids a chance to figure something out on their own. That changed people rather than thinking about it. And so we have two school initiatives and all our materials are free. So I can brag about them um, without sounding like I'm trying to sell you something. And, and they are these. Um, the Let Grow Project is something that Acton Academies probably are doing on their own, but if not, just do it, just download the materials. 
um, where the kids are given a homework assignment, go home and do something new that you've never done before on your own. And it's for K through eight. And you can, you know, if you're a, you're a kindergartner, maybe you make your own sandwich. And if you're eighth grade, maybe you take the bus to the next town over and you go visit somebody or whatever. You get yourself to the beach. You just, it's, we have a whole list of things. And I think the list is actually a little, a little underwhelming because I think people can do more stuff that's not on the list that's kind of too exciting to even put on the list. But anyways, you don't have to do what's on the list. You talk with your parents. I want to do this. I want to visit grandma. I want to make a meal. I want to go to the store. Whatever it is you want to do, you and your parents agree to it. And the parents have what they had, what, what the people in the television show had, which is an excuse. We're being told to do this by the school. We don't have a choice. And we're not the only ones. Everybody else in the class, everyone else in the school, everyone else in the district, whoever, you know, is doing it. And so you're not the crazy, irresponsible parent and you don't have a choice. And that's the genius of it. It just gives parents the excuse and the push to let go. And when the kid goes and does the bike ride or goes, I, we had one mom who wrote to me, she got, the kid got a, went to get his hair cut and came back with a mohawk. Nice. You know? <laughs> Isn't that great? But she said, but after that, she started running, you know, going and sending him on errands. And then she said, look it, you're doing all this stuff for yourself. You're going to do your homework too. And she stopped doing homework with him. And it was just, it just gives this breathing space between you and your kid because nobody tells you when it's okay to let go anymore. And so they don't, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, my mom sent me to kindergarten walking because every mom did. And yet I walked my kids through fifth grade because every mom did. So you need somebody in authority. And it's the teacher saying, today you have to let your kid do something on their own. So the Let Grow Project is a revelation and we have great videos on our site of, you know, a title one school that did it where we're very high poverty. And then we have this middle school that did it in middle to upper middle class neighborhood and all the kids had been so anxious beforehand. And it was like, it was like we gave them, I don't know, four zine plus uppers. They were happier and more relaxed at the same time. And, um, and one kid actually got off his anxiety meds after doing this. So I just have to, I just have to push for that. And then the other Let Grow initiative for schools is what we call the Let Grow Play Club. It's Peter Gray's idea. Keep the school open before or after school for mixed age, no adult intervention, free play. Put junk out there. You know, you put balls, yeah, jump yeah, ropes, yeah. cardboard boxes, old uh, motorcycle parts, <laughs> but not a whole motorcycle. They want to ride that, <laughs> put it together. And, um, and let the kids figure out how to have fun and what, whether the ball was in or out and is this game boring? And, you know, the little kids play with the big kids and the big kids, like we, we somebody studied a play club, a like girl play club and re realized the older kids were developing empathy because they were helping the yes. little ones and the little kids. I mean, you must see this at Acton. We're holding yeah. themselves together because they didn't want to look like babies to the gods who were in fourth grade. Right. <laughs> <You know>? right. <laughs> so, it's just so simple. I mean, yes, you have to have a person there, probably legally, you know, above 18 watching, but they, they are instructed not to solve any of the arguments and not to come up with the games and not to offer great suggestions and not to hurry things along so that you can get to the fun part because figuring all that stuff out between you and your friends, how are you going to play and what's it going to do? What are you going to, you know, whether the ball was in or out is really what play is doing for kids. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Well, yeah, Acton is exactly that. Our recess prior to, you know, before school and after school, there's no adult. The first couple of years, man, that was hard. The staff was freaked out. The parents were freaked out. But over time, it just became normalized. So now, I mean, I'm talking about my personal Acton. There's yeah. in the states that are different, you know, different. But here, oh my God, the, the, the overprotection is even worse. And so that was hard, but we did it. Um, we do a lot of an act in a loose parts play and yeah. undie play. So it's just like all the wood and the tubes and the crates and the ladders, and they can just like build everything. And, and that's the two rules. Adults cannot intervene unless there's like a serious, like physical harm about to happen. Um, and they can only, they can just only be there. They can't really talk or they just <laughs> can just, sit there you know in case somebody's yeah. really hurt and they can't intervene in any fights or anything like that it's yes like, oh it's amazing yeah the first I remember the first time we had a physical fight at school and I was like 
oh my God, what are the parents, you know, we're getting, they're going to be like, so upset and everything. And then I remember I told somebody, some father, like we had a fight at school today and he was like, it's about time. And I was like, <laughs> yes, like, wow. it just wow. made me feel so like free, you know, like, yes, these things are going to happen and it's part of growing up. And then a couple years later, my son like punched a kid at school and I was like, uh. Good for you. Like, okay. I mean, not, not like I wanted him to hurt this not child, like, but yay. it was like, right. it was like, there was a boundary broken. You enforced it. Did, did you overdo it? Yes. Big time. Do we have to talk about it? Like, are you going to work? Yes. All that. But it was like something happened because that that's a huge learning opportunity, you know, yeah. and nobody like everyone's fine now. You know what I mean? So I just started to think about things, including physical fighting as being, um, potentially a positive thing. So, so that's, that's good. That's amazing. Uh, how, how long do they come in the morning? Like how, how much, what kind of stretch like of time is there? 30, 30 to 45 minutes, like to, just depending on when they get there, like doors open at seven forty-five, and nah, well, COVID it's different, but usually doors open at seven forty-five, and school starts at eight 30. That so, sounds great. And they're just down there. And like just doing whatever. And it is mixed age. It's like six years old to like 13. Mm -hmm. That's so, exactly it. Yeah. How yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So yeah. It is. It's really fun. Um, so, wow. Well, okay. So that's let grow. That sounds amazing. I'm definitely going to check that out um, and invite parents to do that um, explicitly for letting them do stuff at home. And um, all right, I'm checking out my, ah, Very so true. the free range parenting bell Tell us more about oh, that. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. That's we're in the thick of that right now. So um, somebody once heard me give a talk and I should go back one further step. Sure. All my ideas come from other people. I don't have any ideas of my own. The free range, the, the let grow project was a sixth grade teacher here in Manhattan came up with her. Her name is Joanna Drusen. Uh, the let grow play club, as we said, was invented by Peter Gray. And then somebody once wrote to my blog and said, you know, you're always saying kids should play outside, but what if parents are afraid that this is going to be, you know, somebody's going to call 911 and say, I see a kid outside. You should change the laws. And I was like, oh, that's a good idea. And then I was actually looking at this yesterday. She actually wrote up a like, whereas the crime rate today is lower than it's, you know, at 50% lower than it was in 1993, whereas children are getting depressed and diabetic and obese, whereas, you know, children are getting anxious and their anxiety has gone up as their freedom has gone down, whereas, whereas, whereas we proclaim that children deserve the right to, you know, be outside and walk to school and you can't mistake this for neglect. And so I started ending my talks with that. I said, you know, I got to do all these, you know, do the Lecro Play Club, do the play, you know, everything. And also you should change the law, said I, to anybody who would listen. <laughs> and somebody did. Uh, yeah. This guy named um, Connor Boyack, who runs something called the Libertas Institute um, in Utah, thought that's a great idea. And he went and he found somebody to sponsor the law, which was a guy named Lincoln Fillmore in the Utah uh, legislature. And he presented it and golly, if it didn't pass unanimously, it did. And they called it the free range kids law and it passed in 2018 nice. and it passed unanimously. And it, it, it made a big uh, splash because first of all, it's weird that you have to say kids are allowed to play outside now in Utah. <laughs> right. It's like, wh what, <laughs> you know, and it's not like most parents are getting arrested or investigated for letting their kids do things like this. But the fact that they have to second guess themselves at all drives me crazy. Yeah. And, and, one of the reasons they're second guessing themselves is because whenever I hear about a case like that, I give it tons of publicity. And once again, people think it's happening all the time. I'm like, I'm like the Texas shooter. Right. Where parents get arrested <laughs> for, you know, letting their kids play outside. So it's, it's good and bad. Um, but anyway, so after that, then we had uh, the law was uh, passed. It was doing great in Colorado last year, passed unanimously with um, bipartisan sponsors um, you know, a black and a white, a Republican and a Democrat, both the ladies were sponsoring this bill in um, the Colorado House and it passed unanimously there. And it was like three days away from its day in the Senate and COVID hit. And so 
that one has flatlined for a year. But now we are hearing um, this, the, uh, a law like that has been proposed in, we're waiting to see if it'll pass this year in South Carolina, Nevada, Texas, and Oklahoma. Wow, I'm so, sure Texas. Texas is so free. I hope so. I yeah. hope so. You know, people, people are, it's hard to change something once it has changed a certain way. And once you think that like, well, we might as well be able to check out any parent we want um, because maybe we'll find some hidden abuse or something. It's like, I do want you to check out where there is evidence of abuse, but there's no evidence in letting somebody play outside. Right. There's no evidence in letting a kid come home with a latch key because you're working two jobs and your seven year old has to sit at home from three thirty till six when you get home. I mean, you know, maybe you wish you had the money for a babysitter, but if you don't, that's not a crime. That's just life. Yeah. So um, what's nice is that we have bipartisan sponsorship in most of the states and um, and in Nevada, it's particularly great. It's a gay black Democrat mom of one and a white, straight, Republican grandma of 20 are, <laughs> are co-sponsoring the law there. So, I mean, because it's not a political thing. It's really, do you want to be able to, to raise your kids the way you think is right and, and give them a lot of independence? And the answer is, yeah, why wouldn't you? You don't, you don't have to, but if you want to, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't have to worry that this is going to get you arrested. That's great. So if you, I, I, this is like endemic and everything that you talked about, but if I always ask, like, if you have a parent listening mm -hmm. and they love it, but they feel kind of like scared, like what would be your advice to them? Scared of letting their kids play outside or yeah. scared of, uh, and okay. So if they're scared of. Like whatever it is they're scared of, like riding a bus or playing outside or right. you know, sleeping over, like what, yeah. what would be your. There's a couple of things. Um, First of all, everyone thinks that there's a way to get to zero risk. Like if I never let them do X, then they won't be in danger. But there's there's a yin to every yang. I mean, you know, people worry about kids waiting in cars and people don't realize like more children are killed in parking lots than waiting in cars. I mean, there's just no absolute perfect safety. Mm -hmm. And similarly, if you're keeping your kid at home because you're afraid that they'll go outside and be snatched, well, that, that crime is like the, the least common thing on earth, at least in the United States. And, you know, so they're at home. So they fall down the stairs or whatever. I mean, there's, there's just no... There's no absolute zero. Right. And right. so what you do is, you know, they, there's an old expression for this, which is that you can't uh, prepare the path for your child. So prepare your child for the path. And I've gotten two great pieces. Like I said, I get everybody else's advice um, that I like to pass on. And um, one of them is the three R's, which are taught by the Boy Scouts now. And um, if you're afraid of your kids being like abused or molested or anything, rather than worrying about stranger danger or, you know, seeing where the dots are on a map. Um, most crimes against children are committed by people they know. Yeah. As, so prepare them for that. And the three R's are this, teach your kid, and supposedly you can start as young as age three, just like you teach them to stop, drop, and roll if they're mm -hmm. ever in a fire, which by mm -hmm. the way, I also have never been in. Um, have you? No. Yeah. All right. But you still teach him to stop drum roll. Anyway, so the three R's are recognize. Recognize nobody can touch you where your bathing suit covers. Okay. okay. Nobody's allowed to touch you there. Uh, resist. Somebody bothers you or wants to touch you or hurt you. Um, kick, scream, yell, run, do whatever. You know, punch them in the nose. Your son yeah. is getting a lot of experience. <laughs> um, and then the last one is report. And report means report to me. Like, yeah. you know, even if they said, don't tell anyone or I'm going to hurt you if you tell anyone, nothing bad will happen to you. And I won't be mad at you. Yeah. For telling me. So you take away the shame and the fear of talking to you and you have really just disarmed the, the bad guys because secrecy is their best weapon. And you've just told your kid, you don't have to have a secret. Nothing bad is going to happen. You're reassuring them. So that's the greatest thing you could do for, you know, really preparing your kid for that. And then somebody once wrote to me and said, teach your kids 
uh, you know, we always say don't talk to strangers. Like that's that's bad advice because yeah. actually if you need any help, there was, there was that Utah Boy Scout who got lost. And when, when the, the search party went looking for him and they called, you know, Jacob or whatever his name was, he would hide and not say anything because they were strangers, you know, and he was starving and finally they found him. But um, I mean, that's obviously an extreme example. But teach your kids that they can talk to anyone, anyone. You just can't go off with anyone. And that right. way they don't even have to worry who's a stranger, who's not. You can do you want to get in my car? No, I can talk to you, but I can't get in your car. Come, come with me. No, I can talk to you. I can't go with you. Yeah, so. that's great. Okay, that's great advice. And then I always ask this too, like, what is a metaphor that you would say for comparing like overprotection to free range kids? Oh, a metaphor. Well, there was a, I looked this up and I actually think this might be an urban myth metaphor, but I like it, which is that um, supposedly, you know, when an egg is about to hatch, do you know this one? Yeah. Yeah. If you if you like help the bird by opening the shell and cracking it open and saying, here, I, I helped you. Aren't you glad the bird dies because yeah. it hasn't had the it, it hasn't developed the muscle that it needs to develop in its neck by pecking, 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 pecking at the eggshell to get out. So you think you've helped them because you've taken away this big burden of having to get out of the shell. But in fact, you've crippled them because now their neck breaks because they didn't build it up by trying, you know, by doing the pecking themselves. And I think that that's, that's a pretty obvious metaphor. I love that. We, you know, I saw that in uh, remember in, well, in public school in the seventies, like we would see those um, film strips. That was a film strip that we saw. And I never forgot it. Yeah, I was like riveted and I've never forgotten that. Um, I love that one. So so to me, that's interesting. Like I want to do a story someday about like the silly little things that we never forget Mm -hmm. and and they are significant. You know, why do you always remember that? It's not just that it was cool. I mean, look what you're running an act in. You know, there might be a direct line between the film strip and your job. <laughs> Seriously. Yes, I know. I think about that, too. Like the key, the key learnings that I had when I was little and I, I want to like capture them. And I and I do. I wonder, like, was I particularly like open that day or did, was it just like a really great film strip or what? You know what? But there's or certain you, things like you, that. Yeah. Or or you, it just hits your sweet spot. I mean, you yeah. might have already been this person really interested in self-reliance without ever using that word. And and so, of course, it hit you and, and stayed with you. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe other people in that class like forgot or maybe everybody remembered that and it was like (laughs) such a great film strip i have no idea but i hear you do that project i would love it i'll contribute (laughs) oh you know what actually i did a little mini project and i would like to do a bigger one um donors think about this i i did a piece for reason on there's a there's a wordsworth poem and i believe me i don't know any other wordsworth poems but this one was called um the le- one of the lines is the child is father to the man. Mm-hmm. And that resonates with me because I feel like what you're interested in as a kid, if you have some free time and get to pursue it or get to figure it out can really, you know, help you find your way in terms of what interests you as an adult. And like, like what was I obsessed with as a kid? I wanted to start a fad or a phrase that everyone would use. I made jewelry with words on it. You know, please, if only I could start a phrase, that would be it. And, you know, so you I, did. Think kind of cool. I know, isn't that weird? That's I mean, it's also it's like boss what? named after it. That's yeah, so I know, cool. but isn't it weird that, you, you know, but anyways, my point is, so I interviewed all these people and I'll tell you my favorite story, um, which is that I got to meet this famous man. And I asked him, what did he do as a kid that he loved doing um, that he sort of saw himself still doing now? Like, what did he do for fun? And he's like, nothing. And I was like, hmm, could you think a little more? <laughs> and he said, well, I played. I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, just can you give me anything else? And he said, well, actually, yeah, all right. So when I was a kid, I grew up in Miami. There's all the fruit trees. The fruit falls from the trees onto the sidewalk. And he would pick up all this fruit, which is somebody else's stuff, but it's on the sidewalk, so it's free. And then he'd put it in a wagon and then he'd go around and sell it. And I was like, and you still do. <laughs> so you take somebody else's stuff and you still sell it because it was Jeff Bezos. 
Wow. <laughs> oh my gosh. Great story. Yeah. Then you but interviewed then, him. Yeah, for- yeah. I met him for like 10 seconds. But um, uh-huh. the point being that so many people have stories like that when they think about it. And that's another reason that parents have to give their kids and schools should give their kids more freedom to figure out what interests them, which involves goofing off and not spending every moment studying or presenting a project. It's just like, you know, you don't think you're going to find a job in coming up with a phrase that you hope will be a fad, right? You just right. have like to there's have no some major in college for that. Like you have yeah. to, you just, your life like winds and winds its way there. Right. So, so when I'm trying to come up with like, you know, we all want our kids to do well and succeed and be happy. And one of the things that we discussed is the independence, but part of it is just discovering what really interests you. And there's too many weird, quirky things for, for you to put your kid in a class to study all those, you know, there, yeah. I mean, there's, there's chess and there's ceramics, but there's, you know, making stuff out of toilet paper or whatever. There's just so many things and kids just need time to noodle around. And if they do, maybe they'll start the next Amazon. So let's talk for a minute about online. Like I always shift to this because right now this is like, you know, my son is 12 and my daughter's 10 and they're, we've been on lockdown for a year and they're, my son is like super into Minecraft. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I, and so then sometimes at three o'clock in the morning when my mind is menacing me, it's like, you, he's, you got, you got to just get rid of all these devices. We're just going to go like fully, you know, out in the real world and my like, kind of yeah like I can't do, do this anymore we're cutting it all and then you know and then other times I'm like you know my children are dominating the tools of their yeah. culture this is not going away that this is you know whatever I think about it I certainly cannot change the trajectory of history. And so <laughs> it's going to you know is he doing what he really loves? And that that's going to take him to the place where, you know, he is ultimately like a happy, healthy, free person. Or is it like, am I enabling an addiction that is going to end up stunting him and making him sedentary and unhappy and anxious and all that? And when I look at him in the present moment and I, you know, see this child, he's certainly very into it. He is happy. He seems free. He needs to exercise more. Um, But so sometimes, do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. I'm conflicted right, no, you can, you can torment yourself or you can say, say lovey and it's going to be fine. Yeah. And so do I, do I go like, is, is letting him play Minecraft all day the equivalent of like go outside and play and come back at dinner time? Or is it the equivalent of, you know, whatever, like allowing, you know, the social dilemma and like all these horrible (laughs) social dilemma is really scary, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so like, I don't know, which I I don't, I don't know. Like, and I know you're older, so you're like, had a different, yeah, I don't know either. Um, I can tell you a couple of things that are reassuring. And once again, it's just, you know, it looks like I'm speaking, but it's actually Peter Gray. (laughs) Right. And actually also Barbara Sarneka, um, who's a, sociologist, I guess, or psychologist at UC Irvine. Um, Peter Gray took one of these tests that they give to kids now to see, are you addicted to? And it's like, have you ever wanted to do X so much that you lied, you know, that you couldn't stop doing it, that you skipped school to do it, um, that did you have to keep doing more and more of it, you know? And he said, and he checked off, yes, 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 for his older self. I mean, he's remembering back to his childhood. And he said, and the thing he would have been checking off was fishing. You know, he loved fishing. He lied about it, where he was going and he would go fishing. He skipped school to go fishing and he kept wanting to get bigger fish. And that was his entertainment. And frankly, Minecraft is today's entertainment. And, you know, when we don't let kids go out and play forest and, you know, or stick ball in the streets or um, even hanging out at the malls, where can they hang out and, and make things and have, make friends and talk and create and expand their world? It's online. And, yeah. you know, Peter is particularly not worried about it. And he said the kids get bored by stuff that's too easy. You know, yeah. we all do. 
you know, it's like, just imagine if you had to play Candyland for the rest of your life. Oh, so, yeah, I know, right. <laughs> or even once. Um, and so they're, they're the same as us. If, if they were getting nothing new out of it, if they weren't getting better at something, if it weren't a little difficult, you know, there's the proximal development thing. It's like, totally, you don't want something yeah. that's too easy, but you don't want something that's too hard. And so that's, you know, that's Minecraft. I think that's Fortnite. And, and the nice story I got from Barbara Sarneka was this. She has two sons. She did this amazing study about how we think we're judging danger, but we're actually judging moms. You should have her on some point. Oh, yeah, Anyways, I can totally so see she's, that. Yeah, she's fantastic. And um, so her sons are like 15 and 19 or something like that, or 16 and 19. And the 15-year-old, and they, they play together online, which is nice because it's that mixed age, but they don't play together in real life. But so the, the 15-year-old was saying, hey, I'm going to, you know, there's this, I don't know, some nuclear weapon you can buy, you know, in the game. If, uh, and it costs $20 unless everybody votes to give it to you because it votes to you on the team and then you get it for free. So I'm just going to ask everybody to vote for me and I'll get it for free. And the brother, older brother said, don't do that. And the younger one said, what do you mean? Why not? And the older one said, because no one's going to vote for you. Why not? Because nobody likes you. Why not? Because you don't stop talking. You kill people when there's no reason to and you hoard the weapons or whatever. And he said, so for the next three weeks, just don't do that. And then you can ask them to, to, to make you part of the team and, and then you'll get it. And so the, the kid thought, oh, that's great. And so it was like, it was like the older son was giving the younger son a hack, you know, like a gaming hack. Right. But it was actually a social emotional lesson yeah. in how to get along with people that the son was willing to absorb, brother was willing to absorb because it was in the context of something fun which is how kids play, which is why you have that free play before act in it. So the kids have their arguments and figure out who's going to be on what team or who goes first. And so that was happening with this. So it's not, it's not just the horrors. I mean, we're always afraid of whatever, whatever our kids are doing. We think it's going to rot their minds, whether it's comic books or mad magazine uh -huh. right? coming full yeah. circle. Right, totally. right, right. Or Minecraft. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. All right. I think that's oh, what wait, my, wait, wait, my wait. I did. Oh. I did have one other suggestion, and once again from somebody else, Audrey Monk, who wrote the book um, Happy Campers. She's a camp counselor, a camp director. Cool. And the thing that she said that was helpful was that make a certain chunk of the day outdoor time. Yeah. And that way it's not you saying, honey, why don't you get off already? You've been on forever. It's like, oh, it's 2 o'clock, outdoor time till 4, <laughs> you know? Totally. That's so a good just, one. Yeah, I did that know. today, actually. They're outside until I finish with you. So that's good. And then I told them I'd give them their devices back. So I'm going to start doing more of that. But I if you make it, a, if you make it part of your schedule, yeah, then it's not you saying like, mom, we did that yesterday. It's like, no, it's, it, it's every two day to four. It's just, right. it's sort of a non-negotiable thing as opposed to, all right, I'll let you, if you give me some free time, I'll give you some, you know, device time. It's, it's not a negotiation. It's just, this is the way the schedule works. Like you have to get to school at a certain time this is f this is outdoor time got it yes i love it okay i yeah. think in the end like all all the listeners after listening to my podcast for a couple of times if they even do they realize like <laughs> i always ask this question about minecraft <laughs> so, oh really it's, like, it's, a it's, like, oh, secret, it's like, like it's like the lightning round <laughs> of my like anxiety really? like but but let me ask you about really? minecraft. right say <laughs> yeah. you had a 12 year old boy who was say right in his room right now <laughs> right oh my gosh anyway this is an amazing talking this to you fun. i hope that i get to meet you in real life um, yeah are you coming to new york at all are you i mean Yes, as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah, I have friends in Brooklyn. And, and uh, yeah, so anyway, I can't wait to come back to New York. So I'll email you when I'm coming and we can go have a coffee great. in Jackson. Oh, we Hyde. will. We will. Yes, we'll have more than that. It'll be really fun. Good. I love it. Love it. Love it. Cool. Well, thank you so very much. This has been amazing. Oh, thank you, Shannon. Thanks for listening to the New Schools Podcast. Tell a friend. Previous episodes and show notes, including any books or websites our guests recommend, can be found at thenewschools.com. If you're a parent who is looking for a new school for your family, send us a message. We would love to help. We can answer questions, share the resources we have, 
and help you get in touch with people in your area who are on the same path, determined to provide their kids with the best education. It's wildly important work. Thank you for doing it. And we'll see you next time.